Amen. Thank you. Sometimes that song that we just sung, we, we wonder if that's true about God, don't we? We wonder if his, his love never fails. We wonder sometimes if uh, God's love has dried up for us somehow as we go through various trials in life. In 1969, there was a rock group that some of you uh, maybe loved back then. I was born in that year, so if you were born before that, you're older than your pastor, and I'm sorry about that today, all right, because I'm feeling it today uh, myself. But in 1969, Three Dog Night came out with a song called One, and maybe you remember how the, the lyrics of that song opened. It says, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as lonely as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. Boy, they don't write songs like they used to anymore, too. They're just, boy, you had meaning in the 60s when you wrote songs. I got to tell you that, all right? Uh, no, it's just an amazing song. According to Wikipedia, one was written by Harry Nielsen after calling someone on the phone, and he got the busy signal. And he stayed on the phone as he heard the beep, 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 beep tone, and he began to write the lyrics to the words one. In fact, the, the opening song, the song actually begins with the, the, the busy signal. And, uh, and that's because of how it was written. It actually reached number five on the Billboard chart uh, that year. And maybe you've wanted to reach out to somebody in your life, but it seems like you continue to get the busy signal. Maybe you've been in conflict with someone in your life. You've tried to reach out to them only to have your efforts rebuffed. Or maybe today you find yourself in a spot where you feel betrayed by those closest to you. Maybe you've had a time in your life that you remember being in a strange place, maybe in a foreign country, a city that you've never been on, on a business trip, or a new region, and you have felt completely alone. Maybe you've been lost in the woods, alone in the lake, home alone for a couple of weeks, new at college with no one that you know, and your family and friends far away from home. And you felt all alone. Every one of us can recall a time in our life where we felt lonely. Every one of us can recall a time in our lives when it has felt like there is absolutely no one there to comfort us. No one there who understands our pain. No one there to protect us or befriend us or understand us. And that may be where you find yourself this morning. I heard an expert on men's ministry speak to a group of pastors once. And he looked at us and he said, man, you need to understand something about the guys in your church. He said, the best word to describe the average American man today is lonely. I got to be honest with you, as I talk with men in my lives, I hear that said over and over again. There's a longing, not just in men, but in women to have those who will come alongside of them and experience life. Ex experts suggest that there are two types of loneliness. The first type of loneliness is called social loneliness. It's the type of loneliness that occurs when we feel isolated from family and friends. It happens when that college student finally finds the freedom and is away from home for the first time in his or her life and then realizes, maybe I do miss my family and friends. There's a second type of loneliness that occurs as well, and that is emotional loneliness. It happens when we don't have a soul in the world with whom we can share our deepest concerns, or at least we don't think we have a soul in the world to share with. It's what we feel when we feel like there's no one who understands what we're going through. It's not just when we're struggling. Sometimes it's that we have no one to celebrate our accomplishments with. We've had some wonderful things happen in our lives and we want to share them with someone, and yet we feel like there's no one there to celebrate the good moments in life with. Some of the loneliest people that I've met in my life are people who on the outside appear to have it all together. I remember a conversation that I had with the supervisor in a very large organization, and he told me, Brian, I'm lonely. I used to have people invite me out all the time for lunch, and I'd hang out with the rest of my coworkers, and now I'm kind of in charge, and I, I feel absolutely alone. He said, I, I used to be privy to all the office conversations, now more often than not, I'm the subject of those office conversations. I'm, I'm the subject of the, the gossip and the complaining. And I thought when I reached this new platform in my professional career, things would get a little bit better. But, but I feel incredibly successful and incredibly lonely at the same time. And had I known that loneliness was going to come with my position, I'm not sure that I would have gone for it. 
If you've been reading along in the challenge this week, you have begun reading the book of Job. I told you that earlier today. It's a journey that if uh, you're keeping on track with the challenge, you're going to finish later this week. It might be your first time reading this Old Testament book. You may have been through this book on multiple occasions. Some of you might be wondering, so why are we in Job? Because we just started Genesis, and we made it through just a few days of Genesis, and then got to Job. Well, uh, that's because we're reading through the Bible chronologically, or as the events happened. And the events of Job happened shortly after the curious events that Darren Geyer preached about last week that occurred at the Tower of Babel. In fact, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that sermon that Darren preached, I want to encourage you to go online. He did a terrific job and really blessed with the staff that we have here. And if you're into numbers, consider this. Genesis 1 through 11, those uh, first chapters that you read before moving on to the book of Job, comprise about 2,000 years of Bible history. The remaining chapters of Genesis consist of only 286 years. So the book of Genesis covers 2,286 years of Bible history. And that is astounding when you consider the fact that the Bible covers only about 4,000 years of history. So more than half of the Bible's history is covered in the book of Genesis. The other 65 books of the Bible comprise of um, about 4,100 years total. So between Genesis all the way through Revelation, 4,100 years or 1,814 years uh, covered in the rest of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 12, which you'll begin to read toward the end of this week, we're introduced to a man named Abraham who was a contemporary of Job the one whom the book of Job is all about. Job was the great-grandson of Abraham's brother Nahor. And what a man Job was. Listen to how Job chapter 1 introduces us to him. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys and very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that one of my children has sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now, I'm trying to stay a couple weeks ahead of you in the challenge this year. And so uh, when I read this on my Bible app uh, a few couple weeks ago, I wrote the following note down uh, after verse 8. I said, no one on planet Earth lived a life as righteous as Job. I wonder who God would say today lives a more righteous life than anyone else on planet Earth. How would I respond if God allowed to happen to me what happened to Job? I hope I never have to find out. Job had amazing faith. I mean, think about that for a minute. There's somebody on living on planet Earth today that God sees as having a life that is more righteous than anybody else. And I guarantee you it's not me. And I'm pretty sure it's probably not you. Maybe that person is here at Woodbury Community Church. I don't know. But I I guarantee you it's not your pastor. And if you and I knew who that person was, my guess is that we'd want to be around them. It's the type of person that we'd want to hang out with. We'd want to experience the joy that that person has. We might want to be mentored by that person if they were somebody in our life. We, we might ask them to disciple us. We, we'd want our kids to hang out with that person's kids and our grandchildren to hang out with that person's grandchildren. We'd want to know his or her secret to intimacy with God. We'd want to know what it was about that person that made them so zealous for God and allowed God to have such favor on him. We might also be a little bit jealous of that person if we were honest with ourselves. 
We might wonder how one person seemed to have everything going so well in their lives. We might be intimidated by them, but my guess is that the most righteous person on earth reflects the character of Christ in a phenomenal way. In fact, I bet that that person would not only be a joy to be around, but that they would be constantly changing people around them for the better because of the way that they lived their lives. I've got to believe this is the type of person Job was. I mean, he even offered sacrifices for each of his children after they had parties at their siblings' homes, just in case one of them sinned. What a dad. What a man of God. What a father. So holy was Job that God said of him, there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. You know, some of you were the teacher's pet when you were in junior high or high school, you know what that's like. I wasn't uh, the teacher's pet. I was far from it. There are some who might say that Job lived his life like he was God's pet. God took great pride in his servant. And then verse 9 tells us that Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and all his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a riot on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people. And they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And then Job tore his robe. And he shaved his head and he fell upon the ground and he worshipped. And he said, naked I have come from my mother's womb. And naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And verse 22 makes a careful point to share with us. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I don't believe there had ever been a day in the history of the earth when one person had received so much bad news. Job lost everything. All of his children, all of his wealth, his prestige gone. And one day, his wife and a few faithful friends remained and his response blows me away. Job worships God in the darkest of days. Have you ever met somebody like that? Have you ever met somebody and you look at their life and you say, I can't believe the way that you have responded to the difficulties and the trials and the pain in your life. If I was you, I would be cursing God. And you somehow seem to be able to respond with a spirit's maturity and a peace that I can't even understand or imagine. When our friends Mike and Sharon lost their 12-year-old son in a freak accident, I was asked to preach the funeral sermon. What do you say in a moment like that? What do you say to comfort a family who, in many ways, has honored God with their lives, they've served Him, they've boldly told others about Him, they've given generously to God over the years, they've served in short-term missions as Sunday school teachers, taught Bible studies, tried their best to be godly role models, and then God has allowed their only son to be taken from them. And I'll never forget listening to Sharon say, 
The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was an incredible response. People who walk with God know that God walks with them through even the darkest of days. In the worst trials, God somehow gives strength to move forward as we rely upon him. And Job understood that. By Job's second chapter, Satan has come back. And he has the audacity and the gall to say to God something like, well, Job follows you now because he has his health. I mean, what if he didn't have his health? I know I took away his family and his riches and his children, and, but, but what if I took away his health? Let me attack his body and he'll curse you, God. And so God basically allows Satan to attack Job's health but not take his life. Look at Job 2, 9 and 10. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Should we not receive good from God and shall we, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Job still honors God. And then the attacks begin to come from his closest friends, from his advisors, his counselors, those he trusts. Three men named Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar begin to question Job's integrity. Surely Job must be a very wicked closet sinner for God to have allowed the calamity to come upon him that he has experienced. Why would God allow somebody who was really righteous to go through the trials that he's going through? And from Job's chapters 4 through 31, you see this incredibly long discourse where one friend after another comes before Job to basically say, you're wrong, Job. This has come upon you because you must be a sinner. And it's so tragic because Job really did nothing to deserve what was brought upon him. He was the most righteous man in his day and age. In Job 18, it's Bildad's second chance to tell Job everything that Job had done wrong. Each one of these men have three times where they come before Job and tell Job all of the terrible things that Job must be guilty of. And Bildad in Job 18 basically tells Job that uh, he's a sinner. And I love what Chuck Swindoll has written about the encounter. Swindoll says, here's the way Bildad thinks. God is just and God is fair. God not only punishes the wicked, he blesses the righteous. And if you repent, God will bless you and relieve you of your affliction. And if you don't repent, he'll keep on judging you and your pain will continue. Repent. And he writes, here's the snag. Job isn't in need of repenting because he hasn't done anything wrong. But like some folks to this day, Bildad's theology doesn't have room for mystery. Everything is black and white. If you obey, you'll be blessed. Those in God's will enjoy great prosperity and good health. But if you suffer, you're out of God's will. He wants everybody well. What flawed theology. Since God is sovereign and powerful, if he wanted everyone to be well, guess what? We'd all be well. After all, he is God. Swindoll writes, he isn't like that. He's running the show, if you will. He deliberately allows sickness. For mysterious reasons beyond our comprehension, he permits pain. And then there are other times for reasons that are not clearly revealed that he tests us. And the point is that he's in charge. That means we're not. If we pray for the healing of an individual and healing doesn't occur, we are not to conclude that it's his or her fault because God doesn't want everyone to be well. And then he says, I want you to reread that sentence. God doesn't want everyone to be well. Paul prayed three separate times that his thorn in the flesh would be taken from him. And the Lord answered, no, no, and no. Paul not only stopped praying for relief, he accepted God's firm no as final. And then he responded with an acceptance speech that cannot be improved upon in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. He has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a magnificent 
in a mature response, Paul was willing to accept the mystery of God's will in leaving him with the affliction after he had urgently prayed for relief three times. But Bildad left no room for mystery. You know, as I read through the book of Job these past couple of weeks, I was impressed with the fact that Job's three friends didn't say everything wrong. There was actually a lot of truth mixed in with some of the things that these guys said. You read some of the words of Job's friends and you see these beautiful truths about God. But you know, it's a little bit of truth mixed in with lies that can impact us in an incredibly negative way. Given enough time, that little truth mixed with lies can cause us to doubt. It can get us off track. It can get our eyes off God and onto ourselves and onto our situation. And even Job, the most righteous man who ever lived on the face of the earth, when hit time and time and time again by his friends, began to question. I think I would have questioned a lot sooner than Job did. I'm sure many, if not all of you, would have questioned too. When we deal with unspeakable anguish, pain, and sorrow, questions are part of the deal. We begin to ask difficult questions. And Job chapter 19 is one of those chapters for anyone who's ever questioned God. It's one of those chapters for anyone who has ever felt all alone in the world. Job had reached that spot. In verses 1 through 4, you see a man who has felt absolutely wronged by his friends. Those who ought to be there to encourage him and lift him up and hold him up in the most difficult of days have done anything but that. Listen to the anguish of his words. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me, and you, have ash- and you are not ashamed to wrong me. And even if it be true that I have erred, you see the doubt creeping in there? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. It's interesting that Job begins his response to Bildad with these words, how long? Because they're the same words that Bildad used with him the chapter before to basically say, hey, Job, how long are you going to continue in your sin? If you just give it up, you know, God's God's going to make everything better. Look at the verbs that Job uses to describe what his friends had done to him. How long will you torment me? How long will you break me? How long will you cast reproach on me? How long will you wrong me? Those are passionate words. They show just how deeply his friends had wounded him. And if you've ever been wronged by the friends that are closest to you, you know that the pain that comes with that. That type of pain can feel unbearable. And it's not like the attacks came just once for Job. They came again and again and again like waves crashing on a shore. The tongue can be such a powerful weapon, can't it? It can be used for such destruction. Some of us have been wounded by the words of a friend in deep, deep ways over the years. Job's friends remind me of the type of person spoken about in Proverbs 12, 18, which says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Listen, another place in Proverbs, the, the, Solomon says, Faithful are the wounds from a friend, the words that we need to hear sometimes. But these weren't words that Job needed to hear. They were words based on a false premise that Job had somehow sinned, and that sin had allowed him to endure what he was going through. Chuck Swindoll included this beautiful poem, one that many of you have heard before. It's a classic poem. We don't know who wrote it. It's called uh, The Builder. And I'm going to read that poem to you because I think it's timely and thought-provoking. He says, I saw them tearing a building down, a group of men in a busy town. With a hefty blow and a lusty yell, they swung with zest and a sidewall fell, fell. Asked of the foreman, are these men skilled, the kind you would hire if you had to build? He looked at me and laughed, no indeed, unskilled labor is all I need. Why, they can wreck in a day or two when it has taken builders years to do. I asked myself as I went my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder with rule and square, measuring and constructing with skill and care? Or am I the wrecker who walks the town, content with the business of tearing down? I think we know the category that Job's friends fell into. They were wreckers. They carelessly used their words for destruction instead of building up. But it's important to ask ourselves, what about us? 
What do my words do to the people in my life? What am I characterized by the people in my life? Am I a builder in people's lives or do my words wreck people? Do I speak before I have all the facts? Do I speak in a way that builds others up? Or am I constantly worried about my own reputation and my own way of placing myself above others? Listen, Job didn't just feel wronged by his friends. Job in chapter uh, 19 tells us that he also felt wronged by God. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know that then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me from my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone, and my hope he has pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. Listen, God had been silent. He felt distant to Job at this time. He had stripped Job of his glory. Job's hard work, his fantastic parenting, his godly living had resulted in what? He finally comes to the spot where he says, God, where are you? And maybe you've experienced that in your life. Maybe your experience with God has at times caused you to cry out to the heavens and say, God, why are you so distant? Why have you allowed me to go through the trials I'm experiencing? Why, God? Why? Job is describing the desperation that comes when it feels like our prayers are no longer answered. Divine guidance has been taken away. Your good reputation has been stripped away. Hope feels gone. And the positive relationships that you had with friends, family, and God seem like a thing of the past no longer present. It's a desperate spot. And he continues his lament by talking about the fact that he has also felt wronged by family and other friends. My guess is that some of you are there today. Some of you are feeling that desperation today. A new year is here, and there's supposed to be this hope that comes with a new year. There's this time where we say, hey, I'm going to set aside some of who I've been and try to embrace some better things in my life. I'm going to begin to hope again. But maybe today you say, you know, that was last week. And today I'm struck with the reality that even my family and other friends have hurt me. He writes, he has put my brothers far from me and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I am a stench to the children of my own mother, his siblings. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All of my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you like God pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Everyone who mattered in Job's life had turned against him. He could best be described as being all alone. And verses 23 and 24 show us the one wish that he had. He wished that his words would be preserved so future generations could at least learn something from the pain that he was going through. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that an iron pen and with that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Swindoll writes, when I first read that, I was reminded of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, on the 19th of November, 1863. He stood at Gettysburg, surrounded by the horrendous aftermath of a bloody battle, with bloated bodies still lying in the fields under the sun. He stood with his simple little speech written by his own hand, and for sure he believed his words would soon be forgotten. He said, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. 
remembering how permanently his words have been etched into everyone's memory. Each time I read his speech, I think, Mr. President, our nation will never forget what you said in that address. Most of us are unable to remember all that those soldiers did there, but we'll never forget the immortal words that Lincoln spoke there in his Gettysburg Address. Listen, Job had no idea that his words would survive him. Yet, think of it. God chose to include them in his eternal word, along with scriptures like Genesis 1 and Psalm 23 and 1 Corinthians 13 and Revelation 22. We call to mind Job 19, verses 25 through 27 to this day. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my flesh has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. Listen, Job knew that in the end, God wins. In the end, no matter the pain and the suffering that he faced this side of eternity, no matter how much he went through in this life, nothing could compare to the eternity that waits in the future for him. He understood that this world is not our home, and while we live here, we will experience trouble, and it is momentary trouble. There will be times when we'll question God. There will be times when we feel all alone, and Job worked that through. In chapter 19, he works through his suffering and replaces feelings of despair by the end of the chapter with feelings of hope, with an understanding that life, if lived for just this world, isn't worth it at all. Sometimes on this side of eternity, God seems silent, but he's always there. He's always there. He knows what you're going through. Sometimes he is even the one who is allowing you to go through the pain that you're going through because he's in it and he is producing in you something of infinite worth and value. I spoke of some of Paul's sufferings earlier in the message and I want to leave you with these words from the Apostle Paul, second chapter to the church at Corinth. Paul wrote, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are transient, seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. You know, I bet most of us can confidently say this morning that we never want to go through what Job went through. If you want to go through what Job went through in his life, I'd like you to see me after the service and we're going to get you some help, okay? <laughs> Nobody wants to experience the trials that this man went through. He's an incredible example of faithfulness to God in the great storms of life. God would eventually restore Job. In fact, if you read through to the end in, in Job 40, you see that he would bless him with more wealth, more children, more prestige than he ever had before. Job would eventually experience joy again. But he knew that real joy came out of the relationship that he prioritized with God. Those children that he would later receive couldn't replace the children he'd lost. The friends that he had lost, the servants that he had, it could, couldn't be replaced by new. God restored him. But his joy wasn't dependent upon his circumstances. It was dependent upon his relationship with God. I want to close with a challenge to you. Sometimes in the trials of life, we lose perspective. We allow hope, that hope that we talked about during the Christmas season, to be crowded out by worry, by pain, by circumstances, by difficulty. Our feelings can easily betray us. Somebody once shared with me an acronym that I'm sure many of you have heard in your life. It's the acronym HALT. It's the acronym that we hear when sometimes we need to just stop and we need to reflect about how we're responding to the circumstances in our life. HALT simply stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. When we're experiencing any one of these four symptoms, we are especially vulnerable to all types of spiritual and emotional attack. The person who struggles with addiction can find himself relapsing. The person who struggles with depression can find herself in a free fall. The person who feels all alone can truly shut off the rest of the world. And I could go on and on and on. I believe that the greatest solution for when we find ourselves losing hope is to halt. 
to spend some time with God, to get in the Word, to take some time for yourself, take a nap, have a meal, get away, spend time with a friend, pray, get some perspective. Job had all kinds of voices telling him what to do in life. The one he needed to hear from most was God. And God was silent for a time. But if you read to the end of the book, in Job 38 to 42, God speaks. And as you read those chapters this week, and as you go through the challenge, as you go through the challenge, I want to encourage you to take some time. Take some time to read that slowly. Think about the fact that this God who is speaking to Job is the same God who speaks to you through a word that was written thousands of years ago. And he came to you to do in you what you cannot do in yourself. If you're God's child, God has never abandoned you. Never. He promises us that he will never leave us or forsake us. There are days when it feels that way. There are days when we question it. But we can confidently take hold of the fact that he's there even when he's silent. And that what he is doing in us will produce something more beautiful than we can ever imagine. Praise God that he walks with us every step of the way. We're going to take communion here in just a moment. And as we do, I want you to think about the fact that God is familiar with all of your suffering too. And God allowed Job to go through incredible difficulties and trials, but it wasn't something that he wasn't prepared to go through himself. We're going to, uh, next week, talk about this peculiar passage in Scripture where God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, at an altar. And you say, how, how could God ever ask anything of, of anybody? And in the end, God spares Isaac's life, and, and it's really a precursor and a picture to what Jesus did for us at Calvary, of God sending his one and only son to this earth to die in our place. Communion reminds us that Jesus understands suffering. It reminds us that our Savior is familiar with everything and anything that we could ever go through on this earth. And so as we take communion today, uh, may we do what the church has done throughout the centuries. We need to recognize that communion is for those who are God's children. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can begin that today through placing your faith and your trust in him. We're going to say a prayer before we go into communion. And if you'd like to invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, you can do that. And then we'd invite you to celebrate communion with us. But this is something for God's children to come and to remember. And Corinthians tells us that we don't go into this time lightly. And so as we take communion, it's a time for examination. It's not a sin to question God. It's not a sin to wonder sometimes where he's been. It is a sin to speak out against him, to curse him, to uh, do all sorts of other things against him. Examine your life today there's some sin that you need to confess before God, do business with him. You can do it right here, right now. As our elders uh, come forward to take the offering, they will pass the, the bread first. And I want to encourage you just to take some time to reflect, to pray, to ask God like David did in the Psalms, to search your heart, to see if there's any wicked way in you, things that you just need to confess to him. And when you're ready, you take that bread. If the cup comes around and you're still not ready, keep holding on to that bread. Okay? There's no time limit with God. If you need to stay in here after the service ends and you're still holding your cup and your bread because you need to do business with God, then you do that and nobody's going to judge you here. Okay, You take time to let God speak to you today. And then the cup will be passed and if you're ready, uh, we'll take that together as a symbol of our unity together in Christ. The end of the service, every week we have people who are ready to pray with you in my office just as you leave here off to the right. And if you need people to pray because of the pain in your life or sin that you're dealing with or whatever it is, you, you do that after the service today. But we're here to do business with God. We're here to remember. And so if you'd like to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior today and you want to celebrate that by sharing in the Lord's table here in just a moment, I want to invite you to pray this prayer that many have prayed before you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that you're a God who is familiar with suffering. God, thank you that there is nothing that I will ever face in my life that you and I together can't handle. 
Lord, thanks for Job's example. And Lord, thank you for those trials you've allowed me to go through in my life. Trials that have brought me to the point where today I recognize I need you. Jesus, thanks for coming for me. Thanks that you know everything about me and you still love me. Jesus, today I want to ask you to take my life. Take me as I am and do something new. Jesus, I, I confess that I'm a sinner. And there are so many things in my life that I've done that I'm ashamed of that have brought shame to not only me, but to you. And today, God, I ask you to forgive me because you can do that. Lord, I ask you to help me start new and fresh. I ask you to give me the strength to walk away from wickedness and to walk to you and to your open arms which are ready to accept me and love me. Jesus, today I invite you to become the ruler of my life, to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name.